Thank you for tuning in tonight to another one of Orleans Audubon Society's Zoom programs. And I'm gonna introduce our speaker now. I consider Ken and Joelle, I consider Joelle Finley and Ken Harris, our speakers, to be the dynamic duo of birders traveling across the world, doing their wonderful birding trips. And fortunately for us, they're willing to share their adventures with the Orleans Audubon Society. And um, just a little bit about Joelle. Joelle has, is quite a leader in Louisiana ornithology and in the birding community. She has been a leader in the Crescent Bird Club, the Louisiana Ornithological Society, the Sierra Club, the Louisiana Master Naturalists, and in particular, the Orleans Audubon Society. She serves as not only the vice president, but also as program chair and field trip chair, which are big shoes to, to fill. Uh, Ken Harris, we're lucky to have him. Uh, he came from across the pond there. And when he was in the UK, he taught uh, woodworking and carpentry and maths, as they say. Uh, it's a really charming story that I know you will all enjoy is that Ken and Joelle actually met on a birding trip in Australia in October of 2005. Well, let's all think about October of 2005 and what was happening then, or what had just happened rather. So that was, you know, Hurricane Katrina was at the end of August, 2005. So here they were going on a trip right after all the devastation from the hurricane. So uh, what a wonderful way to meet though. And uh, I'm really glad that they did. And we're gonna hear all about their trip to Ghana tonight. So this is a trip that uh, Ken and I and our friends from Canada, Joe and Bud, whom are also somewhere on this Zoom meeting, took um, to Ghana last year at this time. So we were there, as it says, February, March 2020. When um, we told our friend John Sevenair that we were going to Ghana, he had also been to Ghana. He only said three words, it is hot. And uh, as it turns out, it's not only hot, but hotter and hottest. Even, um, well, I'll, I'll save that for later. But um, Ghana is located on the west coast of Africa. It's this little nation here. It's in the uh, equatorial zone, the African equatorial belt. And um, we bird it East Africa. Most people go to East Africa, to Kenya or Tanzania. And the birds are almost completely different in West Africa than, than East Africa. So it's a good place to go to uh, continue your African um, birding list. So here is Ghana. It's surrounded by the, uh, the Ivory Coast, Togo. And I think we all know Togo from the Olympic athletes that you see carrying in the Togo flag. They're usually like four or five Olympic athletes, right? Going in with their Togo flag. And to the north is uh, Burkina Faso, which is, has been in the news recently, that's the area where that New Orleans nun was kidnapped for, a, uh, for quite some time and uh, finally made it home. So uh, Ghana has a long coast. It's on the Atlantic Ocean, mostly in this little Gulf of Guinea, which is this area right in here, but it's still the Atlantic Ocean. You fly into the town of Accra, which is their capital, down on the coast. Ghana has 32 million people, population of 32 million people of which 70% are um, Christian, about 20% are uh, Muslim, mostly in the North and moving down from the North and the rest are indigenous um, native religions. And um, it's, a, it's a democracy, it got its independence from uh, Great Britain in uh, 1957. So I think it was one of the earliest African nations to actually uh, get independence from, uh, from England. It was first um, colonized or discovered by the Europeans, by the Portuguese, 
who came in to the coast and um, it was called at that time the Gold Coast because the Portuguese um, kind of raided the country of its gold. It's still uh, mining some gold and it also raided the country of its um, hardwood forest, cutting down a lot of the, um, the old trees and hauling them back to, to Europe. <clears throat> Other European countries came in, uh, including Denmark and, and I think uh, Sweden and some others. And then finally, England came in. And the, by the way, um, Portugal came in in the 1400s. So it was a long, long time that they have had <laughs> confrontation with the Europeans. England uh, took over like in the 1700s and stayed until 1957. So we flew into Accra, and at the time we went a year ago, COVID was still extremely um, on the, everybody's radar. So um, Ghana had put in some stringent COVID regulations in that before you could fly into Ghana, you had to have a COVID test within 72 hours of leaving. And not only that, but it had to be at a laboratory that was sanctioned by the African Centers for Disease Control. Not that that's their name, but it's the equivalent of our Centers for Disease Control. Uh, there, there was no laboratory in New Orleans that was sanctioned by the African Centers of Disease Control. And our Canadian friends, Joe and Bud, uh, had zero labs in Canada sanctioned by the African Centers of Disease Control. Ken and I found one in Covington of all places, and uh, we went. now if you don't have a smartphone you won't get into most of these countries anymore and everything gets uploaded to a website someplace and you have access to that website and our negative test got uploaded the canadians unfortunately uh got stuck with some sort of holiday so they got their um covid test and they didn't get results for 72 hours they missed their flight going into into ghana they uh, were delayed today. They had to get another COVID test, finally got their results and went on their way to Ghana. And then when you land in Ghana, the entire plane has to be retested for COVID. And you think, oh my gosh, how is this going to work, right? You're going to what we consider a third world country and they're going to test 350 people getting off an airplane. It's going to take forever. They were the most organized, incredible testing system that they put up in their airport. It certainly put America to shame how it worked. And you just got off the plane, you walked, you know, through um, immigration, and then you went through some hallways and you got in a line and you went and you got your nose swab, you went and you got your bags. And by the time you got your bags, the computers that were around the baggage claim already had your results in them. Now, probably everybody just got tested, maybe negative, right? Who knows? But anyway, we paid for that. We got negative result, went out and went on our way. So that was just really incredible for an African nation to be able to, to do this. And then on the return home from um, uh, Ghana, we also had to have a negative test to get back into the US. They had taken a huge parking lot at the airport and turned it into a testing system. So again, you just drove in, you went to one little area, you filled out the forms electronically for the test. You went to another little booth and you paid your money to, for the test. You went into a tent, you got your nose swab and everything uh, electronically was sent. Within three hours, you got the results of your, your COVID test and could get on the airplane in, in six or seven or eight hours and fly on home. But anyway, so we landed into uh, Accra and the I'll say that the bottom half of Ghana, this blue and this green, is um, tropical rainforest. So it's equivalent to New Orleans in August. So you think of humidity of 80, 90 percent with 95 degrees, something like that. As you go north, it gets drier because you're getting into not the Sahara. The Sahara is still a little bit further north. This is all the Sahara, right? But we're approaching the Sahel, which is the transition zone between the Sahara and uh, the um, habitats of the, the northern plains of Ghana, where the temperatures uh, ranged around 107 in the daytime and drier and very, very, very arid. Well, that's what drier means, very, very arid. So there we go. 
Um, let's see, what else do we, okay, so from Accra, we, we went to Kakum National Park. We went to Ancasa Reserve, which is a, a large wild reserve that actually has chimpanzees in it, although we didn't know it when we were there. And uh, it also has some wild cats, so it's and the wild elephants in there. So it's it's nice to see that there's something preserved. We drove. Uh, we spent a little time in, in Cape Coast, which you will see, and then we drove north up through the town of Kumasi, up into the northern plains of Mole National Park, and then we went up to the border with Burkina Faso, and um, bird it there, looking main, mainly for the Egyptian plover which is not found in Egypt, but that's how birding is. Uh, our trip was set up by Ken with his good friend, Errol DeVere. Errol DeVere um, lives in South Africa. He leads uh, trips all over Africa. So if you wanna go birding with somebody in uh, Africa, Errol is your man. His company is called Cheapers Africa, a name that none of us like, including um, Errol. And um, he is just the kindest, most gentlest person on earth. This little guy was one of our local guides in one of our spots. And we all know we're going up a hill at this point. We all noticed that there he was behind us, walking up this mountain path with his water bottle just on top of his head, just walking along with, with the water bottle on top of the head. And it was like, God, look at this guy. That's just incredible. So Errol has to try it. And it took Errol quite a while to be able to stand in one spot with his water bottle on his head, but also notice some sweat moving down off of Errol's brow. Even Errol had to admit, he says, I don't remember Ghana being this hot. So um, whatever was going on while we were there, it was extremely uh, hot. When you go to um, a foreign country, you have to use what's called a ground agent. And um, Ashanti African Tours is the ground agent that uh, Errol used. And, and Ashanti is the one that puts up the uh, itinerary for the trip, where are you going? They know all the lodges. And you have a local guy, and this was our local guy, Philip, who had the smile on his face the entire time. He was just a real doll, just real happy. If you wanna go on a bicycle tour of Ghana, which I don't recommend, Philip also runs bicycle tours. Who would ever want to bicycle through Ghana at 170 degrees, 107 degrees? And he also does butterfly tours. So he knows birds, butterflies, other bugs, bicycles, whatever. Uh, this is a typical uh, Ghanaian meal. It's um, a dough ball. And um, in a minute, we'll get Joe to comment on the dough ball. Piece of fish and some dipping sauce, which uh, Philip liked. So this is our, our friend, Joe Henning from Canada. And Joe, if you unmute yourself and tell us what you thought about this dish. Um, it's not, it's not, it's not polite. <laughs> so I will say I had to leave the restaurant when Joe's dish came. It came late yeah. and uh, I had to leave. I couldn't watch her eat it. Well, and the dough ball, the dough ball is, um, it's like the thickest, blandest, potatoy thing but thick and gummy thick gummy <laughs> potatoes with no taste and it's a lot but you're supposed to take it in your hand if you're Ghanaian and then dip the dip it in the sauce well it I had a few bites but that was kind of it but the sauce was kind of okay but when I ordered the fish to be in it because you could have goat or fish or chicken or whatever and I thought, well, fish, tilapia, that sounded good. Well, the whole bloody fish was there <laughs> in one whole thing with everything intact and with just a spoon <laughs> and trying to figure out, well, by the time I tried to move skin off and eyeballs out, the whole thing was a big mess. So yeah, it was, that's probably enough to say. <laughs> were, you, were you full afterwards? Uh, yeah. <laughs> but that was probably full from just looking at it. <laughs> she was the only brave one. She was the only one that ate Ghanaian food. And you, uh, can tell, you can tell the look in my face. This wasn't my favorite dish. Oh, I, I think it looks like you're loving it every, every, every bit. <laughs> but so if you survive the, the meal, that's good. If you don't survive eating the Ghanaian food and you die, you get your face on billboards on the sides of the roads. And this poor guy 
died a year prior to our going, but his billboards were still up and they were advertising his funeral. And I love the fact that they give his name, but he's also known as Mr. Banner. It's like, okay, well, you know, his name is Banner, but he's also known as Mr. Banner. So you, you get um, four o'clock in the morning, starts the visitation until 10, and then they bury you. And you go into a nice graveyard. The graveyards were in the forest where there was very, very good birding. And Bud, Joe's husband, Bud, we walk by this and he says, oh my gosh, he says, look, there lies mad Margaret. And he says, I can't believe they put your personality disorders on your headstone. And we looked a little closer, Bud, and would it be fine? You're muted. I'm muted. Yeah, what we found was the mad actually was an abbreviation for Madame. So she, wasn't, she wasn't mad after all, but she, she was wasn't mad after all. Audrey. Well, she might have been mad. Maybe she was <laughs> mad about the heat, but maybe that did her in. But uh, that period saved her, her reputation. Yes. Yeah. Thank goodness for the period. We did go to Cape Coast, and this is called the Cape Coast Castle. And I put the castle in um, uh, quotations because they call it a castle, but it is very far from being a castle. This was the site of the first Portuguese fort that they built. It was a wooden fort. And later, um, it, and they used it for warehouses for getting out the gold and getting out the, the wood. And then later on, it transformed to transport another commodity out of, of Ghana. And um, this is the entrance in that building down to the male slave dungeon. So this was a place where human cargo was um, held. They had two rooms. This is we're standing in one room and the room is going from left to right. It's it's deeper with one small window at the top for ventilation and light. This would not be light coming in here. Second room, there were 500 men in each of these rooms. They were shackled. They were fed. And uh, if during the course of your waiting for a boat to come in, perhaps two weeks or perhaps two months, maybe you went a little crazy and uh, went off the deep end. The, um, and these were the British. The British had dug some tunnels where they could spy on the, the poor men as they were in there. So if you kind of went goofy, they would come and haul you out, take you to another spot and put you in a room that had no, no uh, ventilation, no, no lighting, double doors to lock you in there where you were just left until you died. And um, they would, there'd be other dead people in there that you would be thrown and you just wait to, to die. And let me go back here, because this is what really drove me mad is that the British had apartments up here for their elite that were running this place. And they also built, built a church. So on Sunday, the church was above the, the, the male um, slave dungeon. So on Sundays, the British and their families would all go to church above the misery that they were causing um, the people down below. And, and that was so hard for me to reckon with. There was also a female dungeon down here, um, which they wasn't quite as bad, except they did get raped and they were babies. And never mind, we'll skip all that. President, President Obama was there in 2009. I stole this photograph off the website. And I just love the idea. Here he is holding on to his little girl's hand. Here's her tennis shoe and he's holding on to her hand. I think this is Michelle back here. And just listening to the, the, the story of what went on, just the look on his face, I think is incredible. This is Bud, this is our Canadian Bud, and he's going out the, um, what's called the door of no return, because this is where the, uh, the men were moved when the ships came in, they were moved, and this is outside the door, so the sea is right there, and uh, there would be awaiting slave ships to, to load them into and, and carry them across the uh, Atlantic. So the whole thing was just very, very traumatic. Um, and Ken did ask, I mean, here's Ken with his English accent, right? And we're talking about all the stuff that the English did. And Ken did ask, well, first I'll go over this. This is a plaque 
that they have on the wall. And if only this were true, you know, an everlasting memory of the anguish of our ancestors, may those who died rest in peace. May those who return find their roots. May humanity never again perpetuate such injustice against humanity. We the living vow to uphold this. Um, Ghana will welcome any um, descendants of slaves from around the world, America, to come back to Ghana. They will give them a naming ceremony so they could have their um, a, a Ghanaian name. And you know, if they want to stay in Ghana, fine. If they don't want to go back, they can go back to America with their um, their new African name that uh, will connect them somehow to their roots. But Ken asked Philip the question, and the question that Ken asked was, how can the Ghanaian people deal with this memory of this horror that was set against them by the English? And here he is with his English accent. And Philip, very wise, Philip said, that was history. He said that happened a long time ago. He says that that was history. If it was happening again today, it would be a different story, but it was history. So they could put all that aside and uh, move on, which I found incredible. And we moved on. So we moved on to birding. Bud and Joe are not with us on this part of the trip because they hadn't made it to Ghana yet. Um, so that we first went into the, the Shy Hills, which was to the east of Accra. And this is kind of the, the scrubby uh, habitat that was there. And we did see some nice birds in the Shaw Hills, a uh, white-throated bee eater, purple roller, chestnut owlet. We always had a, another local guy just for that area. And this local guy, we had knew where these birds, this, this owlet was uh, on its day roost. So we like could walk right up under it, which was nice. And then we went to a, a lagoon area closer to the coast and uh, typical um, water birds, black winged stilts, which are found all over Africa. Wimbrel, which is the same wimbrel that uh, we have in America. So it's a wide ranging species. In the palm trees that were along the lagoon, things like the splendid sunbird and this very drab uh, mangrove sunbird, which is probably the drabest sunbird of all, but anyway, has his name, mangrove sunbird. And we stayed uh, then in the town of Juqua at the Rainforest Lodge. And this is where poor Joe and Bud got off their airplane in the morning, got their test for COVID, drove, I don't know how many hours to the Rainforest Lodge, met us there. And then immediately we went into Cocoon National Park. So they were like jet lagged and everything else. Cocoon is known for um, a beautiful rainforest and a um, series of canopy walkways, which oddly enough were designed by the Canadians. So Canada has their own walkway similar to this and somehow somebody in, in Ghana knew that and they contacted the Canadian engineers and got them to come over and help them design these um, walkways, which are about 130 feet above the, uh, the forest floor. So we did a lot of birding from these walkways. You can't bird from here. You have to bird from um, the platforms that they have built around the trees. And here's Bud. Very Here's a platform where you can set up a spotting scope and, and you can see the, the walkway goes on behind here. It kind of forms a big circle. And here's Philip who really knows how to get around in these things. He's practically running across this. Um, I followed Ken onto this walkway once, and then I said, nope, never again, because Ken would take a step and the thing would juggle, you know, would kind of swerve to one side, and then I would take a step and it would swerve to the other side, and you wound up bouncing off the, uh, the rails. So we all kind of went one at a time. But then you can look down on the birds. You can look down at the, the, the upper canopy birds. And uh, this is a, a drongo, is a whole series of drongos in Africa and, and Asia. This is a um, West African drongo called the Fanti drongo. This beautiful blue-throated roller, which actually does have a blue throat. He was standing, he was sitting on one of the uh, uh, supports of the walkway. 
Ken's photograph of this redheaded Malimbi. So the nice thing is you, you have birds with names you've never heard of before, like Malimbi, who knows? Hornbills, you know, of Asian and African hornbills. This is a white crested hornbill found in West Africa. African pied hornbill, which is more widespread. And this very odd looking, this is Ken's photo, very odd looking black cast wattled hornbill. So here is the wattle around the eye, which is blue. Here's the big cask it has on its, on its bill. A cuckoo bird called the cuckoo. So there are a lot of cuckoos in, in Africa and Asia. This is the Senegal cuckoo. A chagra looks like a shrike. Look at the hook on the bill. Weavers all over Africa. This is a village weaver, which also is found all, all over Africa. And they're called weavers because they do weave their nest out of little, um, um, what, fibers, plant fibers. So here's a nest that's probably finished. And this guy is, or gal or something. No, this guy is uh, weaving a, a fresh nest up here. Woodpecker, a lot like our red-bellied woodpecker. It's the fire-bellied woodpecker, and it only has red right there, which you can barely see, or there in the vent. Nice kingfishers. This, this pied kingfisher is found, again, all over Africa. A woodland kingfisher. And um, nice um, reptiles. Red-headed agama, you forget about the, the name red because it comes in all different colors. This guy was kind of orange instead of red. The people also still use the forest. It was a national park, but the people still would go in the forest and harvest whatever. And this little girl I thought was so cute. And if you look carefully in her hand, she has a cell phone in the middle of nowhere. The coast of Ghana, a lot of fishing, as you could have seen in Joe's uh, uh, dinner, you know, the fish are coming from the sea with a myriad of bones attached. A lot of raptors, so this is the uh, African harrier hawk, another sunbird, green-headed, although it looks uh, blue or purple here. West African waddle eye, which was a special bird for us. The, the waddle, this is the female, the waddle is actually lavender, and it's also lavender here, although it looks uh, black on the male. Cute little birds. There were some wet areas we'd go into. This is uh, uh, Allen's Gallinules. So we have Gallinules in, in the U.S., of course, with a different name. Um, this is Allen's, which was a life bird for all of us. African Jacana that walks on water. Look at the size of these uh, feet to hold him up. A duck I'd never heard of before, heart lobs duck, who knew? Sunbirds, another sunbird I'd never heard of, Reichenbachs. Another weaver. And then we moved from, um, from that park over to Ancasa, which is on the border with the Ivory Coast. And there's only one road going in and one road going out. And we were in these little um, Jeep things, which I couldn't even climb into. They had to find a step for me. And we were lucky in that um, there was a brand new lodge that was built. Prior to this lodge being built, you had to stay in tents. And Errol kept telling us, you know, they're promising me the lodge is going to be open, but I don't know, but I don't know. And sure enough, thank goodness the lodge was open because here's the air conditioner down here, which made it nice. And this was a little restaurant area of the lodge and the grounds of the lodge had a lot of real nice birds. I mean, this little guy was right off the dining area, a black bee eater, collared sunbird in the garden of the lodge. Pintail wida, which um, this is the winter plumage and in, in, uh, breeding plumage, this guy has a very, very long, long tail and they're, they're real fancy, but we weren't there at the right time of year. And this poor guy, who knows what he got into, but he's missing his tail. He's got a big gash taken out of his neck, but he's still able to eat an ant. So he's got an ant stuck in his mouth and looks like he's gonna survive the ordeal. 
In order to go into um, the national park, you had to have a, uh, an armed guard. And we always know from past experience, experiences in India that the armed guards usually can run faster than you. And they're usually the first ones to run when something comes up. So you have to be um, on your toes. But again, smiling, he's got a shotgun shell in his hand. There are forest elephants here. This is where they had the chimpanzees, which I don't think would bother us. And um, there were some, some cats. So here's Joe in our little vehicle going through the track of the um, forest. And beautiful, beautiful forest, untouched. Uh, with still some big trees left that the Portuguese didn't, um, didn't quite get to. And the weather, usually it was foggy in the morning or a little rainy or something. And so this is how birding is. And we were looking at this bird right here, which is a great blue taraco. This little green light is the laser that either Philip or Arrow were point, was pointing to show us where to look for this bird. And, um, you know, finding them is not always easy because they really blend into the uh, surroundings. There are pools of water that um, are interspersed within the, um, in the forest. And at night around those pools, you can find things like owls. So this is the um, Akun Eagle Owl. And then the, um, this is actually a rail. It's a forest rail, um, Negolingu rail. And I'm just gonna play what this guy sounds like. <laughs> Stop, 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 stop. So anyway, here you are deep in the forest, not necessarily water around, it's dark. These birds are roosting in trees and their rails, which you normally find right in the marsh on the ground. So you never know, you never know what you're going to, ah, stop it. You never know what you're gonna find. Nice little fly catcher. Uh, not a very good picture of a red belly paradise flycatcher, but if you just follow the tail down, it just keeps going, 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 going. Quite, quite pretty. Another white-throated bee eater. Uh, Down fly of some kind. I thought he was incredibly gorgeous. Some of the other habitats around there were um, rocky and, and dry with a different set of birds. This was a uh, very good bird. And I, you know what? I can't see, I can't see my name up here. Oh, now I can. Red wing warbler or prinia. And taracos, which are I think everybody's favorites when you go to Africa, there are different species all over. This is the green taraco, very, very fancy um, heads and cute little bills. And then, but the thing is when they take off, they flash these gorgeous um, red wings. It's just the color red in the, in the feathers. It's just amazing. And it's just usually a green bird sitting there. This is also another Taraco, um, but they're called plantain eaters. And I guess I'm gonna be smart and say they must eat plantains. Shikra, uh, an excipiter. Yellow Crown Gonalek. I love these names. Lesser striped swallows that were nesting in the overhang of a metal building. They're sitting on some wires here. Looks like they're getting ready to build a nest. And then we moved up north, not uh, real far north, but about two thirds, no, about a third of the way up the country to this very special place where they're trying to protect this bird called the rock file. And the man that owns the company that Philip works for, Ashante African Tours, is attempting to preserve habitat for birds and preserve birds by getting the locals involved in their protection. So this is the village right outside the forest where this special, special bird lives. And he has built a lodge, um, which wasn't air conditioned by the way, and uh, he has the village people working and running the lodge. So they have a stake in maintaining habitat. I was supposed to be taking Joe's laundry here, but I don't think she was wearing red long johns. Uh, she did have her laundry done and maybe somewhere hidden somewhere we have uh, 
Bud and Joe's. Never mind. So the bird that we were looking for has this range. Here we are in Ghana. We're located about here. So it, it, it's totally West African. It's in a um, family all to itself. And the trail that you walk up, this is where the guy had the, the bottle on his head. The trail you walk up in the lower part was lined by um, cacao plants. So this is chocolate being grown. And the villagers also would grow the chocolate. Habitat for the bird was this uh, fairly heavy forest area. They're ground loving birds. They um, build their nest either on rock overhangs or in caves. And here is a nest right here. The nest is made out of mud and um, some grass material. The birds uh, have very thick, very well-developed thigh muscles. And so they, um, they do more hopping than flying. And they actually can hop like 20 feet up to get in here into these nests. They roost in here at night. And uh, we climbed up that hill late in the day. And then we sat on this nice little bench they had prepared for us. And we waited for the birds to come in. And eventually they did. So this is the, uh, the rock file or the picothartes. And it was um, amazing to watch because these birds just came right up 10 feet from us, five feet from us or something while we were sitting there. And this is bare, this is a bare head. So uh, part of the bare head is orange, part of the bare head is, is black. They eat frogs and whatever else they can find on the ground of the forest. And then they just hop up into their little nest. And I don't know how they don't knock this thing apart because they're big, they're chicken sized birds they're not small birds. And uh, this one hopped up, then he hopped down again and it wasn't quite you know time to go to bed or anything else. So it kept going in and out. This is a bird that, um, Every time we were in the proper habitat, let me see if I can do this. Every time we were in the proper habitat, Philip would play that call and play that call and play that call. Finally, as we were coming down from the Picothartes, or maybe the next day in the same area, this bird replied. This is Ken's photograph. And um, luckily, or luckily for the bird, it's you know fairly well hidden behind leaves. But here's the tail down here. Here's an eyeball right there, gray head. Rufus side, the long-tailed hawk. This is a bird that Jennifer, before we left, Jennifer said, I hope you get to see the long-tailed hawk. So um, I got this lousy shot of it um, leaving the perch, but at least you can see, you know, the, the, the shape of that tremendously long tail, kind of rounded wings. So we were excited. Ken had asked to see a pangolin because they have pangolins in these forests. And um, we have, local people with us and they went off at night as we were coming back from birding and found a pangolin but the pangolin was uh off the trail a good bit so with flashlights we had to walk through the forest a good ways this is my lousy photograph of the pangolin so the head is somewhere around here you can see some feet and this is a long tail i took this off the internet just to give you an idea what this looks like so you know pangolins are uh, desired by um, Asians for their aphrodisiac properties of their scales. And so they're very um, pricey and um, endangered. And luckily, you know, the guys from this village, they know where these things are and you kind of tip them after you give them some money after they find it for you. And they're happy enough to protect the animal rather than to uh, poach it. So that's a good thing. Some other birds of the area are tinker birds, little speckled tinker bird. Uh, blue spotted wood dove, they have blue spots on their wings. Barbets are one of my favorite world birds, except not this one. This is, I think is the ugliest barbet um, that you can find because he has a bare naked head, which is black, 
He's got these bristles on his nose and no color at all. Usually barbets are very brightly colored um, birds. Um, African emerald cuckoo, aptly named for its color. And walking the, the trails, it, it, it had rained and whatever, and you'd be walking down the trail and, and nothing but, you know, a big, huge puddle of water. And as we approached, we saw this stuff, you know, jumping out of the, of the water. And then finally we got to one patch to where they didn't jump right away and we realized that they were frogs. Well, there are frog, frogs everywhere. You see all the background, frogs, 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 frogs. Thanks to, thanks to Bob Thomas for identifying this um, frog for me. So the snouted grassland frog. And of course, if you're gonna be watching these frogs, you're gonna to wanna to try and photograph one jumping. And this is the best I could do, but look at the tremendous legs. Uh, wouldn't make very good frog legs for eating because they're so skinny, but um, anyway. And again, in the background, there's nothing but frogs, frogs everywhere. Uh, dragonfly. Grasshopper buzzard. I'm bothered by something from the zoom on my screen here. Dark chanting um, goshawk, which is found all over Africa. Now we're in the almost the far north where it's a lot hotter, 107 degrees and um, very, very dry. And Mole National Park, and they have all these rules like uh, we have um, for uh, our national parks too. So elephants in this park are not tamed. Do not get closer than 50 meters. Take your litter home. Don't bring pets. No firearms. Watch out for speed bumps. Animals have the right of way. And this was our Mole Motel, which Ken and I slept in this wing and Bud and Joe had this nicer looking wing, which overlooked a, um, uh, an escarpment and there was a pool. This is the only place we saw Europeans and we don't know why the Europeans came here. Uh, they had game drives, but there, there wasn't very much game to see. And I guess they like the bar and the swimming pool is the only thing I can think of, but there are a lot of Europeans, no place else did we see Europeans. But off the um, escarpment down below was a water hole where the elephants would come in. And they had these guys in their Ghanaian outfits sitting around the motel, but also on the grounds of the motel were some very nice birds like this upside down pygmy sunbird. And the red cheek cord and blue are right there on the ground. This is a beautiful, beautiful bird. And this is kind of the habitat we walked in looking for shade, which was hard to find because you didn't want to stand out in the, in the sun, you walk through grasslands. And you found some grassland birds like a double spurred spur fowl, Rufus rump lark, a real cute little dove, black-billed wood dove. Some cuckoos, the African cuckoo and this Diedrich's cuckoo. A bird that I've always wanted to see, Bud and Joe saw the southern carmine bee eater um, in southern part of Africa, not South Africa, but someplace else. I don't know where. Botswana. 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 So we had the northern carmine bee eater here, not a very good shot of it. Ken's picture of the red-throated bee eaters, aptly named. Palm nut vulture. White-backed vulture. And again, you'd have water holes um, interspersed in these woodlands where you could find kingfishers. And one particular water hole had uh, uh, these little mud flats around where there were birds like this. Um, Northern Red Bishop. The orange cheeked wax bill here with another cordon blue. Red wing patilia and another cordon blue. Red billed fire finch. Fire finches usually have red tails. Bar breasted fire finch, really cute. Black faced fire finch with his red tail. 
four of plover, which is a uh, completely different plover than what any of us had ever seen before. Greater painted snipe. And then this bird, unfortunately, Bud missed this bird, but um, these are not our photographs. I got these off the internet. So this is a standard wing night jar. And at, at the um, national, at Mole National Park, they have an old runway, uh, airplane runway, which is, you know, sort of clear. And that's where you'd expect to find night jars. And so you go out there at dusk and hang around and hope one flies by. And this one did, one did lift off from the runway and Joe, Ken and I and Errol and Philip all got, got to see it. It was the most bizarre thing in the world when it was flying because it's almost dark. The bird is, is uh, flapping and as it flaps, as the wing goes down, these things kind of stay up. And so they're, they're bouncing back and up and down behind them. And you don't know what you're looking at. It really kind of fools your, your mind to, to wonder what you're looking at. But it's just an incredible, strange, bizarre bird. Another uh, Akun eagle owl. Monkeys. Antelope, uh, we're not good at identifying antelope. I, I call these heart of beast. Maybe they are, maybe they aren't. Uh, Western cob, Western meaning Western Africa. My favorite of all African animals, if you can believe that, though the warthog. Cute little bat. Here's its snout, I guess its nose, eyes, ears wings hanging you know by a hook on his wing on a day roost then we went to the town of larabanga which was just south of mole national park and typical street scene people were kind of living in the streets um goat finding something in the pots nobody really cares little school kids in their uniforms everything being carried on on the heads and Laravanga is known for this mosque. This mosque was built in the 14th century and it's made out of, Bud, you and Joe went in there. Ken and I were too cheap to pay for the tour for the mosque. So we stayed in the van, but Bud and Joe went in, not inside the mosque, but to the mosque. So do you have anything to add about Laravanga? No, it was the first, <coughs> excuse me, it was the first mosque in this area by a very early, um, Muslim traveler, somebody from the Sudan. And this style of architecture is actually typical of Sudan and a not of Ghana, but a sign indicates it's very old and it's been well-preserved. We got to walk around it. We were not allowed inside. So Ken and I stayed in the van. Like I said, we were too cheap and, you know, we, we're looking at the Ethiopian swallows on the wire while Bud and Joe were getting their culture lesson. But just typical little towns along the road, dirt, dirt floors in the houses, very hot, very dry, less housing, uh, you know. Mm. Uh, laundry day in uh, some brown water source, firewood, I suppose. <clears throat> Here's Philip looking for shade. Nice uh, starlings. Look at the uh, tail on this long tail glossy starling. It actually is lavender or purple, which is nice. These are both life birds. Sparrow lark, very pretty, pretty sparrow lark. Another weaver. Oh, I, but I need you for this because I think you told me I had this labeled wrong. So I think you said it was. Uh, I probably told you it was wrong just to annoy you as much as anything else. <laughs> <laughs> so I think I had it. La I think I had it labeled as red billed oxpecker, and I think Bud told me it was yellow billed or vice versa. So I don't know what this bird is, but it's an oxpecker, and yeah. it's, it's not on an ox; it's on a cow, I think. And we went up to the very edge of Ghana with uh, Burkina Faso. This is actually Burkina Faso here. These people are going back and forth 
the open border, I suppose, the White Volta River, which is a main river that flows all the way south through Ghana. Jo Joelle, if you go back to that slide. This one. Yeah, the far shore is Togo. So this is where the three countries come together. So we're standing in Ghana, we're looking at the far shore of Togo and this little bit of Burkina Faso is it stuck between the two of them. So the okay. ferries were actually operating between three countries. Good, good. That's it. And they weren't really um, like refugees or something. They were just going about their business back and forth across the river, right? Probably. So this is Muslim territory. So you can see the women in their beautiful uh, outfits. And we went there looking for the very rare Egyptian plover. This is my lousy shot of the Egyptian plover, which is on the far shore. So it was probably in uh, Togo. It was in Togo. Yep. So I have a Togonese bird on my list. And this is off, this is off the internet. So this is what the photograph should have looked like. It finally got put into a monotypic family. So it's in a family all to itself. And a um, red-necked falcon flying along the, the same river. Ken's photograph of the red-necked falcon, but look at the pantaloons on this bird. It's just amazing, the, the black and white stripes. African paradise flycatcher, which is found all over Africa and quite a, a, a splendid bird. And if you just follow the tail, down, 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 down. Who knows, it goes into the white. But that is a tremendously long tail on this um, beautiful little bird. And we were birding in a farmer's field and we noticed a bird struggling in the net that the farmer had put up on the edge of his field to um, keep the birds from predating his crop. But Errol and Philip had to go over and rescue the bird. So they, and then the farmer came over and uh, had a little chat and he didn't seem to mind, but we realized the bird was gonna go back probably the next day and land in the net again. But here's the bird that was rescued. It turned out to be another life bird, the bronze-tailed starling. We did a little birding in a um, arboretum somewhere along the road where we did have a trogon, beautiful tambourine dove, Strange spider, thank to Amy, thanks to A. May Thomas for uh, identifying this. It was, you couldn't tell if it was right side up or upside down or something, but here it is upside down looking bizarre. Here it is right side up looking bizarre. And then I uh, went to the um, Etowah range, which was my least favorite place of the entire trip. Because Ken and I, luckily Joe and Bud did not do this, but Ken and I had to walk up this hill, I think it was this hill, and then got to a ridge looking for a um, specific bird. Uh, I have a little thermometer on my fanny pack. It was 97 degrees. It was 10 or 11 o'clock in the morning. We had full sun on our backs. And about two thirds of the way up, my boot was I mean, it's just sloshing in water. And I'm thinking, where is this water coming from in my boots? And I looked down and there was like a constant drip of water off my pants. So the sweat was just running down my pants, dripping inside my boot, making my socks all mucky and wet. And I have never, ever sweated into my boot before. So um, we got up, Philip took us up to the top, a little bit down the, up along the ridge. And we came to these big stumps of trees. And Philip said, well, you could sit down here. So we sat down and then Philip went on to try and find the bird, which he never found. And I told Ken, I'm not moving. I'm not going on anymore. This is it. I'm done. I'm finished. We had uh, a sandwich with us and we had ordered what we thought would be the best lunch you know, on the menu. So we ordered a grilled cheese sandwich which was totally unedible. And then we also had some cookies. So we had cookies for lunch. Ken said about the grilled cheese sandwich, he said, don't eat the crust. He said, tear it in half and eat the middle part. Well, I tore mine in half and ate the middle part, threw the whole thing into the forest, ate my cookies and Philip came back and I said, Philip, we're done, we're not going on. 
So we start heading down, we come to a crossroad and we knew that we had to go left to get back to where we had started. Philip turns right and we stop and he looks at us and I said, Philip, we said we're not going on. He says, well, don't you just want to walk down here? And it's like, no, you got to walk down there. Then you have to turn around and walk back up there again. It's like, no, we're not going any further. So we went back. Bud and Joe had taken the van back to the hotel. So we had to sit for 45 minutes in the sun waiting for the van to come back to get us at the end. I hated this place. We went there two or three times. But um, anyway, there were some nice birds like this double toothed barbet. You see, it does have some color. Chocolate back kingfisher. Who knew, you know, that uh, chocolate was the color of the kingfisher? Uh, mustache grass warbler. Pia Piak, this is Ken's photograph, and it's named that for its call. Compact weaver, a weaver that you could actually identify. Half the weavers, you can't tell what they are. A toad, thanks again to Bob Thomas. And the most gorgeous butterfly in that area. I've never seen a butterfly this color before, but amazing. This is on uh, Ken's shirt, probably getting the salt from the sweat off of Ken's shirt. And then we went to an area, the um, Kalakpa Reserve in the city of Ho, outside the city of Ho, which is in the far western side, uh, southwestern side of Ghana. And um, these people, I guess for some reason, tried to turn around and got stuck in the ditch and we somehow made it around them to continue on to the uh, reserve. But we're looking for night jars here. So in, the, in that road at night, we had to stay out there after dark, were uh, a pair of night jars, brown night jar and long tail night jar. And in the town of Ho, as we were coming back to the hotel after being in that reserve, this lady was standing in a busy intersection on the road selling her her produce, this was eight o'clock at night and she was still trying to, to, to make some money. And she had her hair all up in rollers, which I thought was kind of cute, her baby on her back. And every time you buy something, they put it in a black, black plastic bag, which wound up on the ground. So they had plastic waste all over the place, but I thought she was quite beautiful. And on the way back to Accra, at the end, we did stop at the Volta River. This is the same river we had up north. Um, this is where it's dammed and makes a huge reservoir. And we had some swallows. This was the lesser striped swallow we had seen earlier. And look at the size difference between that and the rufous chested swallow. I mean, just this is a huge bird. And this is a little bitty bird. Another weaver, which is hard to figure out because here's the underside of its tail. Obviously, this is its belly, but its head looks like it's twisted around looking at you. So. Um, go figure, but he's working on his, his weaving nest. Another Drongo. Grasshopper. And then it brings us to this guy. This is a guy that we never, ever saw. We only heard, and we heard it numerous days in a row. And let me, I have to use my phone here. Sorry about this. I could not get the sound on um, on my um, computer. But this is the noise we would hear while we were birding. It's going to get louder, so just give it a, a, a little bit of time. So of course we thought when we first started, we thought that some kid was being beaten or something. It just sounds like some kid screaming, but I guess that's their love courting or their vocalization. And, and I thought I would leave you here and wish you pleasant dreams. You can um, think of this hyrax as you try to fall asleep tonight and uh, hear his uh, scream. But it was during the day and it was in a lot of the forest area wish we had seen him, but we didn't. So thank you so very much for your attention. And thank you for, for tuning in. And if you